Dr. Ben Carson.
Have you noticed that our populace, in many cases, is not very informed and educated anymore? Do you ever see any of those man on the street interviews? <laughs> They'll say, like, what two country border the United States? Uh, California? Florida? Who fought in the Civil War? Uh, China? Spain? I mean, it is. It's kind of funny, but it's frightening. Because people who are that ignorant will fall for anything. And, you know, one of the things that we need to continue to emphasize, particularly in the educational front, is the true history of our nation. You know, our history is what gives us our identity. And our identity is that thing upon which our beliefs emanate. And if you destroy any part of that chain, you become like a leaf blowing in the wind without a solid foundation. That's the reason when ISIS goes in and conquers a place, the first thing they do is destroy the history, destroy the museums, destroy the libraries. And it makes it much easier to control people. And there's a massive attempt to control people in this country that was going on. But our system was designed to thwart that. You know, our people fought so hard, our founders, to give us the kind of constitution that would control the natural tendencies of the government to control people's lives. And they fought, and at the last convention, constitutional convention, it looked like they were not going to be able to agree. And then the elder statesman, Benjamin Franklin, said, gentlemen, stop. Let's get down on our knees and let's seek wisdom from the Lord. And they prayed and they got up and they resolved their issues. And when Franklin came out of the Constitution Hall, a woman said, sir, what do we have here? A monarchy or a republic? And Franklin said, a republic, if we can keep it. No one thought we'd be able to do it, of course, the Europeans especially said how ridiculous those Americans are. They think that you can run a nation on the will of the people. You have to have a monarch. You have to have a governing body. But they didn't understand that our Declaration of Independence states that our rights come from God, our Creator, and not from the government. Yet, even though that republic has lasted for 246 years, right now it's under an enormous threat. And we're all going to have to participate in making sure that it continues. You know, some 60 years ago, Nikita Khrushchev said to the White Eisenhower, your grandchildren's children will live under communism and we won't have to fire one shot. Now what did he know? What did Khrushchev know? He knew that all they had to do is gain control of the educational system so you could indoctrinate the kids, gain control of the media so you could spoon feed the people only what you want them to know, shield them from what you didn't want them to know, replace faith in God with faith in government, and raise the national debt to astronomical levels so it can justify massive taxation, redistribution of wealth, and complete dependency on the government. Does any of that sound familiar? That's all the stuff that is going on right now in our country. We're at the verge of a massive change, of fundamentally changing this nation, and we the people are the only ones 
who can stop that from happening. It's not going to be stopped by the government because governments do what governments do. It doesn't matter whether it's Republican or Democrat. They grow, they infiltrate, and they dominate. And it's not because they're evil. It's because they're governments. Just like a lion is not evil because he kills a gazelle, they do that because they're lions. That's what they do. And that's why our founders work so diligently to give us a constitution that would control the natural tendencies of government. We have to understand our constitution and we have to use it as the tool that was designed so that we can maintain our republic. And a democratic republic means that we choose our representatives and they represent our values. But what if we don't choose them appropriately? That's a problem in our country, you know? People do not vote the way they're supposed to. Most people, when they go into the voting booth, they just look for the name that looks familiar. It could be Satan. <laughs> in many cases, it is. <laughs> That's why we continue to get the same thing over and over again. And that's why it is so vitally important that people learn how to vote. You know, when your children or your grandchildren have a term paper to turn in, what do we expect them to do? We expect them to do research. We expect them to do things based on the knowledge that they've acquired. We need to acquire knowledge about who we're voting for and make sure that you vote in your values. That will make a huge difference in our country and whether we're able to keep what we have. But the other thing that Khrushchev and many of the Marxists understood is that the United States was too strong. They've written this many times. We are so strong, particularly because of our faith and our families. And we wouldn't be brought down militarily, but we could be brought down from within by attacking our faith and our families. And what has happened over the last few decades, a tremendous amount of armory against our faith and our families. And look at the impact that it is having on our country. And look how quickly our morality and our strength is waning. But we shouldn't give up. We should never give up. Because as I always say, if God was willing to save Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of 10 people, we got this, okay? <laughs> there, there may be some turmoil along the way. <laughs> But, you know, when uh, the 2020 election was over, I said, finally, I can retire. <laughs> because I had failed the first time, ended up in government. I said, this time, I'm going to actually be able to retire. But, you know, it wasn't many weeks after that, looking at the direction of the country, I said, I couldn't have any fun on the golf course or cruising around the world. It wouldn't be any fun at all watching my country go down the tubes. So a bunch of tremendous people from HUD joined me in forming the American Cornerstone Institute to concentrate on the cornerstone principles that made our country great. Our faith, our Judeo-Christian values. What do they teach us? They teach you to love your neighbor. Not to cancel your neighbor if they disagree with you. Not to hate the person across the street who has a different yard sign, but to love your neighbor. 
And as we've moved away from that, look at the hatred and division that has taken its place. And then the cornerstone of liberty, freedom, the ability to lead a life that you wish to lead. And look at how there have been those who have done everything they can to compromise those liberties. Most particularly during the last couple of years with COVID, using that as an excuse. Now, isn't it wonderful that just about a week ago, the president declared that the pandemic is over. <laughs> And then the real people who are running the government came out and said, don't mind that man behind the curtain. <laughs> don't worry about him. Because they can't let that go. Are you kidding me? A chance to control people. I mean, this is like the, the, the best thing that's ever happened to them. And you look at all the inconsistencies. It's going to be really hard to get trust back into our government, particularly our medical facilities, who can't even recognize the value of natural immunity. We've known about natural immunity for hundreds of years. Back in the Civil War with smallpox, we learned about natural immunity, how effective it is. And now, you know, Fauci and these people, natural immunity, I heard of that. What? <laughs> Because if they acknowledge natural immunity, then they can't insist that everybody get vaccinated. And, you know, as a pediatric neurosurgeon, you know, I have always had the interest in children at heart. And it really disturbs me that people are insisting that children be vaccinated when their chance of death or major complication from getting COVID is 0.025%. That's approaching zero. <laughs> we don't know what the long-term consequences of MRA, MRNA Vaccines, and we don't know what's going to happen five, 10, 15 years now. Why would we trade almost zero risk for a long term risk that we don't know? Does that make any sense? It makes no sense at all. Those are the kinds of things that are happening in our government, and it's why it's so important that we, the people, vote our values, do our homework, make sure we put the right kinds of people in office. And when it comes to the, the next cornerstone, community, we have to recognize that one of the things that allowed us to grow and be successful is we had communities that cared about each other. In early America, there were communities of 20 families, 50, 100 families, no place else around for the 100 miles. They not only survived, but they thrived because they used their different skills and talents to benefit each other. If it was harvest time and Mr. Johnson was in the apple tree and fell on broke his leg, everybody else harvested his crops. No questions asked. Somebody got killed by a bear, everybody took care of that family. That was the American way. So vitally important for our growth and the strength that took us from nowhere to the pinnacle of the world so quickly. And then the cornerstone of life, respect for life from the womb to the tomb. And as we've grown further away from that respect, our relationships with each other have grown much more callous. And it's made it possible for the purveyors of hatred and division to hold sway in our society. You know, thinking about life, the question of when does life begin? Well, think about this.
there's the female gamut, which has 23 chromosomes. Left to its own, it does not develop into a human being. There's the male gamut, 23 chromosomes. Left to its own, it does not develop into a human being. At conception, they merge into a cell that has 46 chromosomes, a complete genetic roadmap for the development of a human being who is not a part of the mother, who is not a part of the father, who is a completely different human being. And that's when life begins. Amen. in a matter of six to eight weeks, you can see little arms and little legs and a little face with features and a heart that beats. You know, it's really, you've got to really be kind of weird not to be able to see that as a human being. <laughs> as a human being. And, you know, the heart is beating. I mean, I don't know where Stacey comes from. <laughs> I mean, that's an objective evidence that is easy to verify. You know, it must be hard to be that stupid. Love it. Love it. Love it. the Lord will open their eyes. You know, you think about it. You think about somebody like Saul in the Bible. Mm -hmm who was persecuting everybody and killing the Christians, mm -hmm. and how he became the most prominent Christian ever. So, people can't change. We should never give up on them. Amen. And we should extend an arm of acceptance and friendship if they start moving in our direction. We should always manifest a Christ-like attitude. Mm -hmm. And I think we might be amazed by what happens. But that baby goes on to develop very quickly. That brain is adding 400 million new neurons every day. I mean, it is absolutely phenomenal. It's very complex. In fact, that little baby at that stage is more complex than a snail darter. And you have all these environmentalists going around trying to save snail divers, and they don't care about this baby in the womb. <laughs> and then have you ever seen an abortion? You know, in the first trimester, on the ultrasound screen, you see this beautiful little baby. And then there's introduced this tube, and frequently the baby tries to move away from it before it attaches onto a leg and tears it off. Or an arm, and you see all this blood and gore going down the tube. The second and third trimesters, the babies develop too far to be able to suck up with the tube. So now, the obstetrician reaches into the womb with a forceps and just grabs something and starts twisting and pulling and out comes the shoulder, out comes the liver. They dismember the baby. It is absolutely barbaric. And I think years from now, people will look back on this time and they'll say, those barbarians, how could they do such a thing? But we're in the midst of it right now. People who are able to do that, and I can't for the life of me as a physician understand how somebody who has taken the Hippocratic Oath can go in and tear another human being apart. And they say, it's just a meaningless bunch of cells. But you know, some years ago, one of the obstetricians came to me and said, Ben, I know you do things that are sort of on the edge, 
I don't really. I just listen to the Lord. But uh, he said, I have a woman. She's pregnant with twins. And one of the twins has a severe case of hydrocephalus. The head is growing so rapidly. It's threatening to put her into premature labor. The baby's lungs are not mature enough to survive outside of the womb. So we need you to do an operation on the hydrocephalic baby while it's still in the mother's womb to try to save the other one. We know the hydrocephalic baby can't be saved, but the other baby is perfectly normal. Could you come up with something? You know, about three weeks earlier, there had been an article in the New England Journal of Medicine saying we weren't ready to do intrauterine surgery, but it was a lofty goal. But these babies needed it now. Well, I had never done anything of that nature, but I knew of a pediatric neurosurgeon in Philadelphia who was doing some experimental work on intrauterine surgery in sheep. So I contacted him, said, you think we could uh, revamp this thing, make it work in human beings? And he said, yeah. And uh, I was excited. We started putting it together. But then the ethics committee at Johns Hopkins said, you can't do it here because, you know, this is way too experimental. And, you know, it's just, we're just not ready to be able to do something like this. So we went to one of the community hospitals with no ethics committee. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, we were we got set up to do the, the, the operation. And you could see the hydrocephalic baby's head just shrink right on the screen and come down beautifully. And we were able to buy several more weeks of development, the lungs were mature enough so that both babies could be delivered. It was a big national story. My brother called me and said, I just saw you on the national news. But um, then there was a lot of controversy and people were saying it was unethical. We don't have the ability to do things like that. You shouldn't have done that. That is, until it became clear that not only was the normal baby okay, but the hydrocephalic baby was okay. And then they were all saying, well, I would have done that too. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of the way that was. Yeah. But years later, many years later, we're at a banquet, and this beautiful statuesque young woman comes up to Candy, my wife, and says, are you Mrs. Carson? Are you Dr. Carson's wife? And she said, yeah. And she said, your husband operated on me and my twin sister when we were still at our mother's home. And there she has grown up now, able to take care of herself. And that's why you'll never convince me that it's a meaningless bunch of cells. <laughs> was the head of the ACLU, and he was talking about how wonderful the ACLU is, and how they speak for those who cannot speak for themselves and for the innocent ones. And uh, at the end of his talk, a Q&A, I stood up and I said, um, a woman came to me recently, she was 33 weeks pregnant. She was on her way to Kansas to get an abortion because her baby had been diagnosed with a neurological condition. And Kansas was the only place that would do it that late, 33 weeks, that baby's viable outside of the womb without support. And um, I said, I was able to convince that lady not to have the abortion. I was able to do an operation. Uh, the baby is doing well. The woman loves the baby. She's so glad that she didn't have that baby killed. I said, would you speak for that baby? And he hemmed and he hawed and he dodged and he weaved and he would never answer the question. So, at dinner that night, he 
he had the misfortune of sitting next to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I continued the interrogation. <laughs> and I said, uh, you know, there are premature babies and incubators, 26, 27, 28 weeks gestation. Sometimes I have to operate on them. Would you speak for those babies? Oh yes, absolutely, no problem. I said, but the one who's several weeks more advanced developmentally and is in the safest place that can possibly be in the universe, you can't speak for that one? <clears throat> he says, I realize that doesn't make any sense, but I believe a woman has a right to kill that baby until the second it is born. Mm -hmm. And I said, would you say that in public? And he said, no. Well, you know, now they will say it in public. Now they'll even kill the baby after it's born. This is the evil that we're dealing with in our society today. And, you know, in the book of Proverbs, the 24th chapter, verses 11 and 12, read that when you come home. It says, those who are being drawn unto death, who are ready to be slain, innocent ones. Did you say anything? Did you do anything? Does not he who knows and sees all know whether you did anything? And will he not render to every man according to his works? We have a responsibility to do something. We can't just sit there and say, no, it's not my problem. I didn't know about it. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I grew up in a very liberal city. I grew up in Detroit, a very liberal city. And then we were in Boston, a very liberal city. And then I went to college in New Haven, a very liberal city. And then the medical school in Ann Arbor, a very liberal city. Then I came to Baltimore, do my internship and residency, a very liberal city. So I was liberal. And, uh, but even as a liberal, I didn't like the concept of abortion. But I said, I don't like it, but, you know, to each his own. Everybody do what they want to do. I don't have any right to tell anybody else what to do. That is until one day I was thinking about slavery when people thought that they owned other people and they could do anything they wanted to them, beat them, rape them, murder them, whatever they wanted to do. And what if the abolitionist had said, well, I don't believe in slavery, but you know, you do what you want to do. Uh, you know, I don't have any right to tell you what to do. Where would we be? Isn't it interesting? And that made me recognize that I had taken the wrong approach and that I had the responsibility to try to save those wonderful creations of God that are in the mother's womb. And we all have that responsibility and we should never forget that. So, We also have to be smart. We have to be strategic in what we do. And, you know, there's a lot of controversy going on right now in the pro-life arena about should we just try to push national legislation right now at 15 weeks? Or should we wait until after the midterm elections. Now, that's something we should be giving thought to. There's no question that there's not enough votes to pass it right now. So it would really be more of a, just a moral stand. We, we, this is what's right and that's all there is to it. But there are others to say, wouldn't it be smarter to take a different approach and get more people into the legislative body so that we can pass it. And you know, which one of those is the 
right approach to take. I don't know, you think about it. But here's what I did know. Whichever position you take, we're all on the same side, and we cannot allow ourselves to be divided on issues. We must learn to support the right people, to get behind them, and not let anybody fomate the kind of division that keeps us from having the power to save the lives of our babies. That is so important. Adoption also. We have to work hard to make adoption much easier, much less expensive. It's a real problem, particularly adoption for babies uh, who are born here. And that's why so many people adopt babies from other countries. We can do much better than that. And I want you to think about this. I want you to think about what's going on in our schools. And, you know, I, I just want to thank the people of Virginia. Uh, Winston Sears, I want to thank so much for just pressing this issue about what's going on in our schools. You know, think about the human brain. It's a very sophisticated organ system, hundreds of billions of neurons and interconnections. Your brain remembers everything you've ever seen, everything you've ever done. It can process more than two million bits of information in one second. And if you take the human brain and you put it next to an animal brain, let's say a dog, surface topography is quite similar. Frontal lobes, parietal lobes, temporal lobes, exceptional lobes, brain stem, cerebellum, midbrain, etc. But the dog's midbrain is much better developed than the human midbrain. Why? Because the midbrain is what you use to react. That's why animals react so much faster than people who can't like reflexes. But the human brain has much better developed frontal lobes where you engage in rational thought processing. We have the ability to extract information from the past, integrate it with information from the present, project it into the future, a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years in advance, we do complex calculations. And interestingly enough, when we see another person, we don't have to act like an animal, have a midbrain reaction, and judge them on the basis of the color of their skin, because we have those frontal lobes, we can judge them on the content of their character. Great analogy. And yet our schools are trying to teach our kids that the most important determinant of what happens to them in life is the color of their skin. What about your crap? <laughs> I mean, we just can't, we can't just complain about it. We have to do something about it. And, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons that uh, American Cornerstone also has a pediatric component called Little Patriots. LittlePatriotsLearning.com. It's an online free program that teaches the kids the real history of our country. The good, the bad, and the ugly, we don't try to hide anything. But if you're honest, there's a lot more good than there is bad and ugly. And the left just tries to grab the bad and ugly and tries to build everything off of that. They try to teach people, for instance, that we are uniquely evil because of slavery. Well, the fact of the matter is, if you go back and you know anything about history, virtually every society in written history has had to deal with slavery. And if there's anything unique about the United States, is that we had so many people who adamantly opposed it that we were willing to fight a civil war and lose a large part of our population to end the evil institution. That's what we need to do for children. We also have to be courageous and stand up 
against all this transgender stuff. You know, I mean, we, we everybody, Amen. everybody gets equal rights, but nobody gets extra rights. And they don't get to change everything for everybody else. One third of one percent of the population is transgender, but you would think it was 20 or 25 percent. And, you know, the Bible tells us that we need the love of everybody. And it's not our duty to make judgments. That's God's job. But it doesn't say that we have to accept every behavior. We don't have to do everything. We still have to love people. But we don't have to allow people to transition us and change us into something else. There are those who want to fundamentally change our society. And quite frankly, if you look at the Bible and what the Bible says, it gives us direction. And a lot of the immoral activity that's criticized both in the Old and the New Testament they want to say, if the Bible is wrong about that stuff, then it's probably wrong about other stuff too. It's sort of a camel's nose under the tent. And if you can get people to accept that the Bible is wrong about some of the sexual things that are going on, then it's not a far cry that you're going to get people to throw it out altogether. And the fact of the matter is, this nation, is founded on Judeo-Christian values. And there is nothing in the Constitution that advocates for the separation of church and state. That's right. It is not in the Constitution. <laughs> and all of those people who claim it is, do they realize that our founding document, the Declaration of Independence, talks about certain inalienable rights given to us by our Creator, a.k.a. God. Do they realize the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag says we are one nation under God? Do they realize that most courtrooms, or many courtrooms in the land on the wall, it says in God we trust that every coin in our pocket, every bill in our wallet says in God we trust. If it's in our founding documents, it's in our pledges, in our courts, and it's on our money, but we're not supposed to talk about it. What in the world is that? In medicine, it's called schizophrenia. <laughs> doesn't, that, doesn't that explain a lot of what's going on in our country yes. today? And we need to make yes. it perfectly clear that it's okay to live by godly principles of loving your fellow man, of caring about your neighbor, of developing your God-given talents to the utmost so that you become valuable to the people around you, of having values and principles that govern your life. And if we do that, not only will we have a great nation, but we will have one nation <clears throat> under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you.